Amalia Perinii. Pletia Perinii. Catlia Intermedia, variety Angustifolia. Catlia Integrium, variety Angustifolia. Catlia Perinii. Hadrolalia Perinii. Sophronitis Perinii. And Lelia Perinii, seven synonyms for a single orchid. Thank you so much for your interest in this care collab. Today I'm teamed up with Ed's Orchids. Thank you so much, Ed's Orchids, for joining me on this care collab for this rather unusual, sometimes awkward, sometimes frustrating Lelia Perinii. But let me just put it out there right at the beginning. If you're growing this orchid and your orchid has the name of any of the seven synonyms, then please, please, if you want to join in on doing care collab videos in the future with this orchid, leave me a comment below and I will put you on the list. It can be rather confusing with all these names out there. Today, we're going to be talking about Lelia Perinii. She is elegant, she is beautiful, and Lelia just fits her better, in my opinion. So thank you, Ed's Orchids, very much for joining me. As you can see, I have one bloom to show for. This bloom is precious, and we'll get into that throughout this entire video. This bloom at this point in time is not fragrant, but she has been in the past, and she has a very, very light rose fragrant. I would say typical Cattleya fragrance, very delicate, very elegant, but nothing really to write home about. You can see that the orchid is quite large when she arrived. So she's got her longest leaf is about 40 centimeters long. And then you can see the progression is gradual. It got a little bit less while she was acclimating. Then we had a really nice growth last year that was coming back to size. And then this year, we have a rather puny little growth still with the largest bloom that I've ever had on her. Now, this species can get up to six blooms per spike. I have only ever managed two. It is October 2021, and it is the first time that this orchid has actually bloomed for me during her normal blooming season, which is fall winter. Which brings me to the point of the fact that I've had this orchid now almost four years and it has taken her this long to acclimate, even though she has bloomed for me in all the past years that I've had her, but the blooms haven't lasted that long. My reasoning is Lelia perinii blooms do not last long. If you can get two weeks out of the blooms, that is the maximum I've achieved, and I would be cheating because it's normally 12 days. However, I am now thinking that has to do with the fact she used to bloom for me mid-June towards July. Now that we're in the fall and she's blooming according to her right season, I am thinking that maybe this bloom is going to last much longer because supposedly these are long-lasting blooms, something I have never experienced. This bloom is now open three days. And I want to show you something that I find so nice when this orchid comes into bud. It looks like a flamingo beak for me. I grew up in Kenya, I was around the lakes in the Great Rift Valley where there's a lot of flamingos and when that bud comes out, to me it looks like the beak of a flamingo. Then when she starts to show her color as she opens up and cracks open, it also reminds me of the pink plumage of the flamingos. I would not have bought this orchid, to be honest, if I had known about its quirks. So let's get into the quirks because that goes hand in hand with the care. This orchid does absolutely nothing for about eight months of the year. If there is ever a definition of an orchid resting, then Lelia perinii is that. It is an orchid that literally just rests, does nothing, not even in adverted commas. I would normally put in air quotes when I say it is resting because there's always something going on with an orchid 
that we don't see. And yet it is still photosynthesizing, and of course it's doing something, otherwise it would just keel over and die. But in the literal sense of doing nothing, this orchid just sits on your shelf. And if you can grow it to size, which is going to be my goal now for the coming season, the size is quite large. Luckily, it has a beautiful upright growth habit. It's not a space hog in the sense of the word of being floppy and leaning all over the place. You can see that from when I had to stake it up after a division I made, all I did was just hold on to the back leaves just to keep her in place and not have me bumping them off when I take it off the shelf in order to flush it and fertilize it. The orchid has a beautiful upright growing habit little bit of light training keeps those growths in the pot and when i say light training i mean that actually if the light were coming from this direction us right here i always see the back of the orchid so that the growth that is coming out new at the far end grows and moves upright into the pot that helps me with regards to how i can contain this orchid on the shelves when it comes to winter this orchid also in my opinion is the definition of a species everything that you consider about a species it is all incorporated in this orchid she is slow she has her own rhythm she has her regular blooming season and she needs the temperatures so that she can do what she does when she needs those temperatures. It's not like I can fudge the temperatures to make her be more vigorous, faster, or growing to size like what I received her as. And I say that because many, many orchids we can work with. We can put heat mats underneath. We can keep the temperature a little bit warmer. We can push the growth to a little bit larger size and then also push blooms. In my opinion, that is impossible with this orchid. She really is the one that controls you as opposed to you, no matter what you do, fertilizer-wise, control her. So literally for eight months of the year, it is the easiest growing orchid that I've got. All I have to do is flush with plain RO water, just to keep the LECA and the self-watering setup that I have intact and functional. That's pretty easy going when you consider how much other things you have to do with other orchids. So the growing cycle, <laughs> all of a sudden, the previous growth that has bloomed will start throwing out the roots in the winter. I had roots starting in January out of this growth. We know that Lelias or Cattleyas prefer a wet dry cycle and you can see that in my setup there is no such thing. I maintain a level of moisture inside the pot even if the reservoir is empty. So when I see new roots growing in January, it's like, whoa. I need to maintain those roots. I can't let them go soggy. I can't let them burn as they find their way into the pot during the coldest months of my growing season. And let me tell you another thing, the roots grow very, very slowly as well. So it is really a test to get the roots into the pot. Don't let them burn. And that is why I am so conservative on the fertilizer front, even when I see roots growing. Because to get mineral deposits up here on the surface, when the roots come out, it is very easy to burn them. And she is not a prolific root grower. So A, they are very slow. You'll only see one come out and it's going to get longer and longer and you're just begging it to go into the pot. Then you'll see another one come out if anything maybe i saw what i could see on the surface four roots come out and until i don't unpot her and see what's going on in the size that is all i believe i've got and i'm hoping there's a few more in the pot so she's not a prolific root grower and i'm so conservative in the months of january february march and april while she is doing her root growth i only apply 160 parts per million straight into the reservoir. I do not put fertilizer on the top of my pot, but what I will do is take a microfiber and lay it across the top to increase the humidity because she prefers to grow at 360 to 950 meters. That is quite a high humidity that she has there of about 60 to 80%. And the temperatures where she normally grows are a steady 15 to 22 degrees Celsius. In my winter, I have exactly that, 15 to 22 degrees Celsius, sometimes a little bit warmer because she lives right up against the glass for the maximum light that she requires. So her temperatures are fabulous for me during the winter. 
but that is her all year round preferred temperatures. Now, my summers here in Southern Spain can go all the way up to 40 degrees Celsius, which is far too hot for her, but she can deal with it because of my LECA and self-watering setup, because the LECA helps to keep her roots cool because of the evaporative cooling effect that LECA naturally has. So this setup is making it possible for me to grow my orchid. And in the summer then, she is outside on the east facing shelf behind a white curtain for most of the day until the sun has passed and I can open the curtain and give more light. So you can see by all the anthocyanin that she's got on her leaves, the older leaves being much more reddish as opposed to the newer leaves having the freckles, she is getting a lot, a lot of light probably a tad too much for her liking. Let's just say she has acclimated and gotten used to the light levels that I can give her, but that doesn't mean that maybe there's a touch of stress because of those light levels. And it's something I may need to address in 2022. Now that she has found her mojo, she's got the rhythm, she's blooming at the right time of year, I may need to reduce the level of stress that she is experiencing. I don't see my anthocyanin levels to be too high, but I have never had this orchid with green leaves. And when you see other Lelia perinii, their leaves are green. So I could be pushing it a little bit too much with my light levels. And that is something I will determine and consider what I'm going to do in 2022 and then see what happens. My stunted growth, I boil down to having divided this orchid last year. And let me show you the result of that division. Can you see that? Maybe you can see that. Okay, that didn't go very well, did it? This is my classic setup for divisions, rescues. There's hob material at the bottom, kept it always nice and humid, not sopping wet, but there's a lot of humidity in there. I couldn't create a proper dome to keep the humidity maximized. And she held on for, let's say eight months, since I divided her, I have in here five bulbs, which is more than enough, you would think, for a back bulb division. But I didn't want to divide her with less than that because of how thin her structures are. You can see that there's not much reserve in there. So I waited to get five back bulbs to give her more energy to survive. She tried. You can see there, she tried. And then she tried with new roots and then the whole thing collapsed. Why is that? Another quirk of Lelia perinii is the root disturbance is not a good idea. I left all the old roots on. They were tired, they were not viable anymore, but I left them on because the minute that they go wet, they actually provide me with humidity. But when you disturb Lelia perinii and the root system, if you don't have an active growing root system while you repot her, don't touch Alalia perinii because I think that she had plenty of energy until she started to push out this little attempt of a growth and roots. The whole thing collapsed because there was no nutrition going into the orchid. I couldn't fertilize at this stage. There was just nothing to work with. I am not upset about it. I would have loved to have been successful with this division, but I'm not upset. I almost kind of expected that to happen simply because any orchid that you divide with very, very thin structures, either you have a second lead with a root system starting to grow, then your chances are much higher. But to take a back division of something that is so thin on the storage front, very, very difficult if you also have an orchid that is doing everything that we know a species would do. Finicky, slow grower, sensitive about the roots, this orchid will prefer not to ever be disturbed, which is impossible in my case, seeing as I grow in pots and she has kind of a long rhizome. I mean, there's other orchids with much longer rhizomes, but yeah, seeing as she only throws out one growth a year for me, that is, you know, you can see the trend where it's headed and I'm going to have to disturb her again, probably January, February, when this growth right here starts to push out its roots. It's my job now, in the coming weeks, to soften the bracts here, because they are tough as nails as well, 
I'm going to be cleaning up all the lower bits right here, just as I did before, keeping that all clean so that the roots don't have to fight. Every root on this orchid is precious, and I don't need her struggling with herself because these bracts are there to protect the orchid because of their very, very thin base. But where she comes from, she has a lot more humidity than I'd have. So these bracts soften in her natural environment. They won't in mine, and there's no way I'm gonna be misting the base of an orchid during the colder months of the year just to make sure the bracts soften for the roots to grow. So I'm peeling all of this off. In August, I had extremely high humidity, very unusual for my climate here. And you can see that I peeled back the sheath that was growing around this growth while it was developing in August because it was getting kind of wet. Wet in a sense, not because of my watering, but it is a juicy kind of membrane that grows around this orchid. And it was creating quite the environment around the leaf joint right here that I wasn't too happy with. My orchids aren't used to that high of a humidity. And there's one thing I want to avoid, especially with this orchid, is the chance of possible rot. <laughs> When that happens, goodness me, who knows what else would happen and how long it would take to get this orchid back up and running again. So two to six blooms, I only have one bloom to show for, but she is very, very beautiful. The reflection of the walls behind me is washing the colors out a little bit. The images that I posted right at the beginning, those are the true colors. The lip is the most striking part about this orchid as far as I'm concerned. There is a velvet softness, texture to it. And this is something that I just absolutely adore. Be able to see that column stick out like a swan's neck, but then it is wrapped up in this like medieval frill, like a headdress or a neck dress. It is divine. I love the bloom as such. I am hoping that I can update my description in the future to say the blooms have lasted three weeks. I don't know what the definition of long lasting blooms is according to the books. For me, a long lasting Cattleya bloom is a four week bloom. That to me is long lasting. Lelia perinii has never done that for me. So day three, I'm anticipating another week out of her while she looks as good as she does. If she goes up and beyond that, we will see a lot more of her. Right now she's getting 300 parts per million because of the fact she is in bloom. I only started fertilizing her when I saw her pushing out the new growth. And then I did go to 300 parts per million straight away. I wasn't going to mess around. I needed that growth to come. It was so late in my season according to her schedule with me in the past years, but I know now she is just acclimated four years later. So 300 parts per million straight away when the new growth comes. I only fertilize 160 parts per million into the reservoir when the roots start to grow. I flush through with seaweed when the roots start to grow. But after that, I don't do much more because I'm not trying to burn my roots on the surface of the media. And thank goodness, bar a few little speckles that you can see, I think I've got the balance okay with this one. And when she's finished blooming, it'll go down to zero parts per million and just fresh RO water again until January, February, when she starts to push the roots out of this growth. If you grow Lelia perinii and if you're frustrated by this orchid, trust me, I understand you, I get it. I am the same way, but now after four years, I think by Joe, She's got it. And on top of that, let's see how the next year's growth will develop. We'll be here in 12 months time. And if all I can achieve is this size growth, I hope I'll be able to achieve maybe three blooms next year. But with this orchid, I would rather err on the side of caution with regards to fertilizer, be thankful for what I've got. I now have a bloom that is the biggest I have ever seen, even though it's just a single bloom and the shape is exactly how she should be. The other blooms were wonderful. When I had two blooms on a spike, they looked amazing, but they kind of squashed each other out. So it's, I suppose, this orchid is just coming onto her own at this stage in my collection. I know that this video was very long-winded. I do apologize for that. 
but I want to say thank you so much if you stuck with me throughout the entire video. There's a lot to be said about an orchid that doesn't really do much for most part of the year, but it is those pointers that I find very important because if you are growing this orchid or are planning to grow this orchid, those are the details that are necessary to know so that you don't think you're doing anything wrong, your orchid is dying, it is not responding, you're not giving it enough light and all these other kind of components that might arise and you think you're doing it wrong, no. That is why I was a little bit more long-winded with this Care Collab because this orchid has quirks. Knowing that this orchid has these quirks when you're growing it, then you can rest easy and relax and say, she'll come around one day and present you with this beautiful spectacle. I know, again, it's only one bloom, but my goodness, I'm grateful for it. Thank you so, so much, Ed's Orchids, for joining me on this Care Collab. I'm excited to see what your video will be like, what your Lelia Perinia is looking like, what you have to say based on your experience with her in your environment. And the link to Ed's video will be in the description below. Everybody else, your time is so much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I wish you a beautiful, beautiful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.